volunteer names and faith and also so many other new people joining us and we are absolutely delighted to have Ricarda Flemmer with us today. Um, Ricarda is a junior professor for political struggles in the global self um, at the Institute of Political Science at the University of Tübingen. And Ricarda um, holds a PhD from the University of Hamburg. And she's worked in several projects um, on indigenous peoples and consultation rights, for example, also at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, um, as well as at the Freie Universität in Berlin and um, the Pontificia Universitat Catholica del Peru. And as an academic co-presenter and translator, she accompanies the events um, of the Kultur Bureau Grupo Sal with um, Kishwa activist Patricia Gualinga uh, from the indigenous Amazonian uh, community uh, Sarayaku in Ecuador. Her research interests include uh, indigenous people's rights, uh, environmental justice, and interpretative methodology. And she currently works uh, on indigenous ontologies and rights of nature in Latin America which we know is a hugely interesting topic. Um, much um, can be said about this. Um, and um, we are specifically looking forward to Ricardo's views on um, what she also mentions in the abstract, the sort of transformative promise that rights of nature might hold out. Um, in reconfiguring and mediating the relationships between humans and non-humans. Ricardo, welcome being here. It's fantastic um, for the um, um, focal topic on justice and sustainability to have you as our speaker. And we look forward to your presentation. And then we'll have a round of discussions uh, afterwards that I will moderate. Over to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Louis, for this kind introduction. I will start sharing my screen. And I hope you can see it. It should be full screen now. Yes, we can. Um, you might just put it, yeah. Th there we go, perfect. So um, thanks for this kind introduction and um, Maybe one last point I want to mention that I'm a junior professor for political struggles in the global south. And I moved from Hamburg to the German global south, but I'm not from the global south and I'm not based in the global south. So one of the main um, or core aspects or issues for my research is always not to speak about people from the global south, but with them and to try to cross the boundaries of the university in terms of discipline, but also into the society. And recently, um, so in the last year, um, the Excellency Strategy of the German Federal and State Governments has funded the project, uh, the Transformative Potential of Rights of Nature, struggling for alternatives to destructive anthropocentric development. And this is a research project I'm working on at the moment, and I would like to share some of kind of work in progress and findings I have until, until now. So in the coming, I generally plan for 60 minutes, maybe I will be a little bit quicker. I will be going to start with the planetary perspective, and then we zoom into the Amazon um, learn a bit about what a dolphin can teach us about ontological conflicts, and then come back from the global south here to Germany and close. This one last thing I wanted to mention, sorry, is when the project started, the first event we had in January was a workshop with international scholars, indigenous and non-indigenous ones and activists, and if you would be interested in reading more about this, you find the full report on my homepage to download. Someone is uh, still with the microphone on and I hear kind of noises, which are a little bit confusing. Thanks. 
So this talk is structured into five parts. I will start with a very broad introduction um, about the rights of nature and their transformative promises. Then I go into the state of the art and my research agenda. And then we, as promised, zoom into the ontological or the ontoepistemological dimension of environmental conflict in the Amazon. And then we zoom out a little bit and see how this informed my approach to rights of nature, universal thinking, and the politics of translation. And in the end, I will give you an outlook where I'm currently with the transformative potential of rights of nature for more sustainable futures, but also in general to transform our development agenda. I want to start with a quote from the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network from 2016, this is a network of indigenous and non-indigenous women. And they say, the majority of words, legal frameworks are based on treating nature as property, meaning that our life-giving rivers, forests, and mountains are seen as objects to be sold and consumed. Our current legal paradigm further dangers, further dangerous ideas around the commodification and financialization of nature. Even, and we can see the disastrous results of this way of thinking. So I don't have, I think, to mention the hothouse report and sanitary tipping points and a climate crisis here. So I will go right from this quote to what also the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services thinks that we are in urgent need for transformation. And they say, that the goals for conserving and sustainably using nature and achieving sustainability cannot be met by current trajectory and goals for 2030 uh, may only be achieved through transformative changes across economic, social, political, and technological factors. And by transformative changes, they mean the fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social, social factors, including paradigm goals and values. The way of trajectory for transformation, I want to explain in conceptual terms. Sorry, I still hear, no still hear noises from that. Um, is based on the three practices of sustainability formulated by my former colleagues at the University of Hamburg, Atlas and Hilbert. And they distinguish between three trajectories we have at the moment for sustainability. So there's a trajectory of modernization with an ontological understanding of nature that divides nature and culture and sees nature as a source for resources. The ethics behind this are anthropocentric and nature is only um, recognized as having a utility for humans, not having a value itself. The common approach here is monetarization and what is called ecosystem services. As a second trajectory, different from the first one, they identify control. And here the ontological understanding of nature is an earth systemic concept of nature culture. So it's conceptualized as um, belonging together or as a whole, but nature is potentially dangerous. Also here, the ethics are anthropocentric and the value of the earth system is only recognized in instrumental terms for humans. The main approach here is geoengineering. And then they say there's a third trajectory and this is the one of transformation, which recognizes ontologically nature's cultures, hybrids, so pluralistic understanding and nature as a bearer of rights. The ethics behind this are biocentric and the value of nature is recognized as being intrinsic. And the main approach here is the rights of nature and whatever we're talking about more in detail. Also giving voice again to um, indigenous um, activists, Chan Le uh, Lake, Biggs and Gautus from the Indigenous Environment Network. And they say, we need this transformative change because it is time to stop thinking we must protect nature and recognize that as much as every other life form on earth, we are nature. And this is the famous um, graphic to conceptualize this in a visual way. 
so there's not a hierarchical idea, an eco, um, egocentric or an anthropocentric logic with the male human on top, but it's an ecocentric or biocentric logic or ethic that uh, people and all other beings are connected. So I want to just briefly make a distinction when we talk about rights of nature, speaking with the words of Craig Kaufman and Pamela Martin, that there are two related but conceptually different meanings when we speak about rights of nature. The first one, the first understanding is that this is a legal philosophy. And the second one, that it's legal provisions recognizing ecosystems as subjects with rights. And they say, and I found this very uh, important when I myself got into the topic to be able to conceptually distinguish those two, that failing to distinguish between them has led to some confusion. And some current debates have to do with whether these two concepts should be combined, and if so, how. When we speak of legal provisions, it's quite clear. So when we re recognize the legal personhood of a river, for example, but when we speak about a legal philosophy, it's much broader. And usually this legal philosophy embedding rights of nature, so certain legal provisions, is referred to as earth jurisprudence. And one definition or one of the most common ones is by Cullinan, which is also found on the UN Harmony with Nature Program's website. Earth jurisprudence is a philosophy of law and human governance that is based on the idea that humans are only one part of a wider community of beings and that the welfare of each member of that community is dependent on the welfare of the earth as a whole. So what is important here also is to see that this is not only in ethical normative terms, but also in political terms, human government is one. The way Kaufman and Martin um, and they adapted from Mutaito um, conceptualize how the earth jurisprudence informs sustainability or the development model is that it incorporates nature as the broadest circle with the human society being part of it, and then economy is placed on a minor scale. While the current sustainability model sets human society, nature, and economy on separate circles with a kind of same or even hierarchical economy first value. One of the uh, quotes or the quotes you find here in Dubio Pro Natura is from Kadushi, and this is a report for the European Union for implementing the rights of nature and how these can fit into the European Union legal framework. So in practical terms, when we come to rights of nature, I want to start the story by Latin American legal innovations and the 2008 Constitution of Ecuador which was the first constitutional framework that recognized the rights of Pachamama or of Mother Earth, the nature as a whole. Then in 2009, the constitution of Bolivia also recognized Pachamama, but for humans to protect Mother Earth, not as a legal subject or as having rights on intrinsic value itself. This changed later only in 2010 and 2012 with the rights of Mother Earth laws and the uh, um, agenda for development of living wealth. So in both these constitutions and legal frameworks, Tama Kausa in Quechua or Suma Kamana in Amada, the good life, the good living, the one we bear are kind of an embedding factor and the political part and the autonomous part, which are inherently connected to the rights of nature. So it's a broader agenda. Since these constitutions the recognition of nature as a whole of the specific ecosystems, for example, the Colombian Amazon, certain rivers or national parks, and certain species have increased. Kaufman and Martin in January 2021 um, count for 178 legal provisions in total that are recognizing rights of nature in 70 countries around the world. So this means these constitutions, laws, regulatory policies have already passed and have been adopted. 
I want to show you here um, a screenshot of the jurisprudence monitor, and this is a broader mapping. It's not just right with nature, and it's not just adopted legal or standards. It's um, jurisprudence initiatives. So different initiatives recognizing rights of or recognizing nature. It's in total almost 500, 400 of them are rights of nature related. And then you can, um, it's an open access database. You can scroll through the mapping. You can understand what different legal tools are used and which of those initiatives are already adopted and which are just initiatives, so proposals. It's a very good data source. You find the code book online. To illustrate what this means on an international and transnational agenda, the international, um, in the international sphere in 2009, well, since 2009, the 22nd of April is recognized as the International Mother Earth Day. Then two years later, the Unharmony with Nature program was was established. And still there are certain initiatives for um, the EU Charter on the Fundamental Rights of Nature, which I already briefly mentioned before. And it's mentioned in several conventions, for example, the Biodiversity Convention, which always or often refer to harmony with nature. For detailed chronology, that's an open access database and the harmony with nature programs website. For the transnational agenda, so from the activist standpoint, civil society standpoint, there's a 2010 proposal uh, for the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth. You find an English translation at the GARN, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature website. And since 2014, there are the Rights of Nature tribunals, which are held usually um, parallel to the climate summits and um, discuss prominent or rights of nature violations, so to say, by um, lawyers appointed by, um, by the platform. So it's not a regular state run court, it's a civil society initiative with, with a great media network. And you can read all the rulings and the procedures on the web. So rights of nature, from Latin America has pushed for a spread of these ideas and has also arrived in Europe, not only as an idea, but also in legal practice now. Last year was uh, the first case where an uh, ecosystem was recognized as a legal person and the Mar Menor, the salt water lagoon in Murcia, Spain, was recognized as an ecosystem with own rights. As you see, and I wanted to show this picture because it's a highly human uh, transformed landscape. It's not pristine nature. When we talk about rights of nature, this is not about uh, protecting primary forests only or untouched water bodies or things like that. If you want more information on rights of nature in Europe, I wanted to point you to Alex Putz's database on the European Rights of Nature Initiative and also the equal students model. When it comes now into my, into my own research, I want to briefly go through the state of the art and just broadly contextualize where the research on rights of nature is uh, mainly coming from. So anthropologists have led the pioneering studies on rights of nature with a focus on metaphysics of indigenous cosmologies in the Western world so the differences between those different ontologies. Then there's Laza, this political ontology. He has been very influential for my work, also together with Marisol de la Cadena. And then there are several single case studies on indigenous understandings of rights of nature. Most of them deal with rivers, for example, Richardson and Magnish and Luz Lotvian. Those are stemming from two big projects on river rights, uh, also financed in Europe. And then on forest making, for example, on forest ontologies by Andrea Schemberg. Then we have legal literature, philosophy, and ethics. And this literature mainly talks about if different sets of rights, human rights and um, rights of nature are complementary or contradictory. And then there are different 
conceptual underpinnings um, of rights of nature and who can speak for nature in terms of stewardship, guardianship, or legal personhood as a concept itself. We have literature about strategic litigation for rights of nature cases, and then how rights of nature can fit into different constitutional arrangements. Arrangements, for example, Schimmerler has um, talks about this in her article coming to Germany. Then we have um, more recent literature in political geography and political ecology on ontological power relations. And this adds to the material power underlying the conflicts usually looked at in this type of literature. Then there are ideas that political ontologies are plural and always practice related and studies about concrete political ontologies underlying hunting programs, conservation areas, co-management systems, uh, watersheds, and so on. And in political science, as you see, so this is my home discipline, the literature is quite sparse. One of the most prominent or most ample studies is the one of uh, Craig Kaufman and Pamela Martin. And they study governance arrangements, governance arrangements, social movement claims beyond the humans. I'm uh, sorry, the, the, I will go into detail a little bit um, in the moment. Um, and aside from this very specific work is um, rights of nature embedded into different governance arrangements as social movement claims or non-human agency in IR, post-human IR deals with it a very little bit, and IR in the Anthropocene, a very um, fascinating editor volume by my former colleagues, um, Francis Gabriela and Deirdre Wittgenhan. So the work I want to talk about a little bit more is the IR norms perspective on politics of rights of nature. It's a book by Kaufman and Martin that has come out in 2021. And these two scholars have a long trajectory in working on rights of nature also from um, practical terms and um, community work in Ecuador, and then traveling around and seeing that rights of nature are spreading around the world. And the book that they brought, uh, that they published, talks exactly about this experiences and presents it in a very uh, nicely systematized and ample manner. So their claim is that rights of nature are about norms. So it's not um, about legal standards only. It's about normative ideas about how humans contract, construct their relationship with nature. They say it's not a new idea. It's often um, celebrated as a legal innovation, but it's informed by indigenous thought and has legal antecedents also in the global north, for example, Christopher Stone's work from the 70s. But these have you know, these have remained marginal. And it's not the classical IR non diffusion story, so top down non diffusion to the, the, um, to the, to the bottom, but it has been diffused. It has, it has, not, it has not been diffused, but domestic um, settings have made parallel evolution. And they say that it's kind of a piggyback. In fact, that the violence from the states in different settings, especially against communities, have led to a co violation of human rights and rights of nature. And this has led to the codification of rights of nature to ultimately protect human rights also. And the concept or the term they use then is convergent evolution as a concept from evolutionary biology. So, functionally similar rights of nature laws have emerged independently in different contexts but coming from similar environments with conflict constellations. For my own research questions, um, I was most interested, or I'm still um, most interested, how rights of nature can yield legal and institutional models for more symmetric human non-human relations and plural understandings of nature. So how is uh, rights of nature enacted? How can nature exercise its rights? What concepts and ethical considerations underlie these practices and how this enacting of rights of nature has transformatory effects noted or hoped for on previous human nature relations. I found very diverse answers. So looking into the practices I have found from cognitive technologies using blockchain, artificial intelligence to let forest acts 
autonomously, for example, the Digitaler Wald uh, here in Germany. Then we have the Embassy of the North Sea, which is based on, on science and technology studies. There are no word of indigenous oncology, but it's an art project um, with social scientists and sensing technology to learn to listen and speak and negotiate for the North Sea and ultimately get her or it a seat at the European Parliament. And then also in Germany, we have the Initiative für ein Ökologisches Grundgesetz, so a constitutional reform on a national level, but also in several states in Germany. When I talk to indigenous people or what I also read in the literature by Hoffman and Martin's book or by Liz Latvian, is that there's a very ambiguous position towards rights of nature. And it's more of a spectrum when we look at indigenous um, perceptions of rights of nature. So on the one hand, there's a yes, rights of nature was our idea. We have the ownership, it creates solidarity. So rights of nature result from our personal visions. It can help to transform Western law and the law of the West is just a vehicle for our claims. And we need this to mobilize together. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's a no, we don't want to engage with rights of nature. We don't want to engage with Western law. Col colonial international laws have never brought us anything good. How can humans even dare to give nature rights when we are nature? And nature was here before us. Or oh, it's um, giving us life and not the other way around that we can dare to give her life. And that our ideas are being appropriated is also something which should keep people in chaos. And there's kind of in between an instrumental use of rights of nature. So using Western law to get claims through. However, always, and I have not, not met one or talked to one single indigenous uh, person that is not aware that this legality of international or national state law is not there. And one reason for skepticism also comes from international politics. So when we look at the UN Harmony with Nature program, um, it states that devising a new world will require a new relationship with the earth and with humankind's own existence. And then they recognize since, the two, since 2009, the aim of the General Assembly in adopting its nine nine resolutions on harmony with nature has been to define a newly found relationship based on a non-anthropocentric relationship with nature. So it's about a newly found relationship. The resolutions contain different perspectives regarding the construction of a new non-anthropocentric paradigm on which the fundamental basis for right and wrong action concerning the environment is grounded not solely in human concerns. So what this implies is also, and this gets clear later on, to promote harmony with nature or to promote harmony with the earth as found in indigenous cultures, to support efforts being made from the national down to the local community level to reflect protection. So they say that this is a new idea at the same time while um, at least mentioning indigenous cultures, and then it's a very classical top-down implementation. And it's just one word. So there's no room for different ontologies or ideas or of the reality. So the skepticism also has brought me to, um, or still keeps rethinking me, uh, still keeps uh, that I'm rethinking the uh, framework, and I want a conceptual framework that grasps the practices of enacting and understanding non-human agency and ontologies underlying rights of nature, and I want a collaborative research design that follows in transdisciplinary intercolonial and perspective methodology, and this is kind of an ongoing challenge. And then I also want to have as an outcome to give something into policy um, policy for elephant insights apart from the academic um, and research outputs and findings. So one way or my idea or my approach to narrowing this whole 
um, 400 cases of rights of nature initiatives around the world down was to make it about Latin America and Europe and look at cases that have influenced policy making, legal frameworks and our legal activism so that they're already having an effect. Now I want to take the time to zoom with you um, a little bit into the Amazon and what made might um, sound aspect and conceptual gets a very deep and concrete meaning. So the onto epistemological dimension of environmental conflict. And this is also the title of a special issue for society natural resources we are editing at the moment together with my colleague Jonas Pine and uh, the Gena group. When I talk about the challenges rights of nature, especially in Latin America faces, there's an extractivist orientation of the government. So extractivism is, um, is kind of the consensus of the development model, independent from the political orientation of the different national um, state governments. And this has a deep colonial roots. There were different so gold, rubber, oil, or lithium at the moment. And still, this Latin American economy is with consensus as Maria de la Samba calls it to sit. In addition to that, what is important to recognize that there's a very asymmetric, asymmetric structure of conflicts. So this comes from environmental justice, and you also see the participatory mapping of the environmental justice atlas on the left side. It's an open access database. You can easily access and see uh, what conflicts are playing out in different world regions. And this formulates uh, trials of global market prices, national growth, and local impact. So, especially at the frontier, so when resource extractivism, oil projects, for example, move into the Amazon, um, conflicts get particularly violent, especially in indigenous communities. And this is not only for Latin America, the mapping of the environmental justice atlas is also worldwide. And in a recent edited volume, uh, Judith Shapiro and John Andrew McNeish formulate that there's an ontologic of extractivism as a development model. And it's our extractive age. It's not just a Latin American phenomenon. And they say from an historical ontological perspective, the concept of extractivism rests upon a universal, universalizing natural law in which the exploitation of nature features as an ontological prerequisite to the forms that European modernity developed over the last 500 years. And this gives reason for conflict and violence. And when you try to picture these conflicts at the frontiers of extractivism, one of the most violent or brutal ones with over 30 people dead was in Bagua in the northern Amazonian region of Peru in 2009. Then we have long-standing protests against the Melamonchi um, dam project in Brazil, and we have the Pariaco resisting against oil extraction and other projects. And these are just some of the examples. Peru is a country um, I know best, so I want to go a little bit with you into the context of my previous research and what happened after this violent um, outburst after Bagua in 2009. Bagua was framed later as a window of opportunity for prior consultation laws. So for um, indigenous consultation means um, participatory rule, uh, participatory rights for indigenous peoples whenever a project or law attacks them directly in their collective rights. And this has been when um, the consultation law was recognized or adopted in 2011 uh, and through um, pioneering step for Latin America. So after um, not having implemented this, um, this guideline, which was stipulated in the ILO, the International Labor Convention, and that's in 69, which was ratified in 94. Um, this was kind of the first or the, the big official step to have this recognized and to bring this into practice, and also was the first national framework for the region 
to have prior consultation and additional party preparation in there. What happens now is, and this is my lessons learned from, or one of the major lessons learned from this time, that coming from conflict to law and to indigenous participation as a mechanism, this is how intercultural communication looks like. And this picture is from um, a brochure of Pedro Pedro, which is a uh, which is a Peruvian national oil agency, and it reads below: "Dialogo with trans buena fe." So a transparent dialogue um, in good. And this, in the consultation law, stipulates that intercultural communication should guide these processes and they should be culturally adequate. When you look a close, when you take a closer look at this uh, pages with the long and very formal text, these are the consultation agreements. So after the Korean oil agency goes into a community, and this is a real image from a community in the Amazon. Then the engineers talk about the upcoming oil project, and in the end, they want the community to sign such a 20, 25, 50-page document with a lot of tables. And as you see in the end, or in, on the right side, a lot of people signed on this with the stamp of their thumb. So that means they are either illiterate or find it very hard to read and write. So this makes it very clear, I think, how this is contrasting and contradicting. And now we come to the promised dolphin, and this comes And I want you to imagine that you have a consultation workshop in the Amazon with indigenous leaders growing up in the Amazon, living in communities in the rainforest, are going to the Amazonian biggest city they have closest. And then an engineer from Lima, the second largest forest, uh, the second largest desert town after Cairo on this planet, comes and explains what is a forest and what is white life to them. Which is, if it wouldn't be true, that would be fun. Um, but what really happens is that, or what happened is that these engineers then work with PowerPoint slides and try to separate what is being discussed as being part of the legislation and part of the consultation and what is not. And the engineer goes and shows pictures, for example, of chickens, so domestic animals, and asks the leaders, the indigenous leaders in the room, is this wildlife or is it not? And people are very clear that this is not wildlife. And then comes to a paiche. A paiche is a very big um, fish in the Amazon rivers, which is one of the main sources for food for most communities, so part of everyday life. And the engineer asks, is this white life or is it not? And people say, yes, it's white life. And the engineer says, no, it's not because it's for fish and fish have their own laws. So they are part, they're not part of the white life regulation, they have their own laws. Um, and then he shows a crop. And ask people again, is this wildlife or not? And people get intimidated. So they are much more or much slower in responding and they say, yes. And he says, yeah, okay. because the frog can live in the water and on land as part of the wildlife regulation. And then the next picture he shows is this dolphin. And he asks again, and is this wildlife or is it not? And people say, yes, it's white life. And the engineer stops them and says, no, it's not. A dolphin is a fish, and therefore it's not part of the regulation. And people get quiet. It's kind of an awkward situation. 
And from back of the room, one of the leaders has, but sometimes it comes out for vacation, right? And people laugh and the engineer continues. And it took me a long time to understand what had happened there and what this awkward silence means meant and what why people were so confident in saying yes the dolphin is part of the legislation and to understand why an engineer with a false argument in his own scientific system so a dolphin is not a fish it's a mermaid could calm down or silence a whole room of indigenous leaders what one has to know is that the buffet of what like it is called in everyday language in uh, Peru, the Bufeo Colorado, so the Pink River Dolphin, is a being that can live in the water and on land. For most of the communities, not all of them speak Quechua, there are a lot of different languages uh, in the Amazon, but in Quechua it means it's a Yakuruna, so a water being, or people from the water. And it can take human shape, and it can shape shift, so it can transport. But it's very clear that it can walk, can live in the water and on land, and it should be part of what is talked about when we talk about wildlife regulation. What happened there is that there's a hierarchy of different types of knowledges established. So why in modern ontology, nature and culture is, are separated and you have different cultural views on one nature, a relational ontology is based on relations between human and non-human beings. And this includes the Yakuruna, this includes the dolphin, this includes the river. And it means that when we insert an oil project in one of these areas with these um, strong relational connections, then environmental conflicts are also ontological conflicts. So conflicts involving different assumptions about what exists, what we are talking about, what is at stake here. What is important to distinguish is that an ontological conflict is something else than an epistemological conflict. It's not about different cultural perspectives. It is because of a different idea of what the world is, what what exists, and how these different beings are related. And that these different ideas of knowledge and of ontologies are in a hierarchical order. The engineer in front of the indigenous leaders could quiet them down, could silence them, and could decide what is part of being discussed in the regulation, in the consultation, and gets into the legal framework. And this makes it important to speak not about one world, one nature, but about different worlds, and acknowledge the different competing knowledge types. And these knowledge types are embedded in what Mario Blasa has called political ontology. So a hierarchy, a competition, political asymmetry between the different worlds. This is part of the article for the special issue, and I just want to briefly present um, the findings here that Onto epistemological violence, and I built here on Morris' work and on Brona's recent work, but also on um, longer standing concept of epistemic justices or injustices. And they stipulate, and this is a distinction by Brunner from 2021, that there's a micro, a meso, and a macro level how this violence works. On a micro level, there's the coloniality of being, so experiences of violence as a person. And this can exogenously silence a knowing individual. Uh, so this exogenous silencing, so when the engineer silences people and this repeats, so this is something I witnessed in consultation and consultation again, can lead to an endogenous silencing 
embarrassment and humiliation of the people participating. So epistemic death, like Medina called it. On a meso level, the coloniality of knowledge, so the normalization of violence, so that the engineer can silence those people, and that is completely normal because it's always like this and it will always be like that, is a very strong traction component. And then on a zooming out a little bit more, this establishes or um, underlines the coloniality of power of what we understand. So the political orders of violence, of epistemicide and genocide, of the monopolies of knowledge and violence that are established. And what doesn't figure much in Brunner's work is that this violence against humans is also committed against other living beings. So extractive projects may not only destroy human life worlds, but also known human beings and the relationships between the different beings. What I want to emphasize, emphasize here is that I think it's very important that when we speak of ontological politics and the colonial routines, that this is clear, that this is important, that this question of what is at stake, ontological po politics are always involved when we talk about human nature relationships. This may be especially true for environmental conflicts with indigenous people and uh, place-based thinking of communities, but not only that. And this is also true for us, because when I wanted, or when I saw the pink dolphin, I came closer to the shore and the community people drawn me back and said, be careful, this is a dangerous being. It can drag you underwater. So this is not flipper. That's not the benevolent dolphin that we know conceptually. It's an agent which can have uh, power over human, which can be in a good mood and a bad mood. It's an agent. The pluriversal perspective, so not a new binary of indigenous, non-indigenous worlds, is, is um, I think, nicely illustrated in the cover of the edited volume by Kila Cadena and Mario Vlasa. And it contrasts what, when two words collide, illustrate in this photo. So one of the most prominent uh, documentaries about the Bagua conflict 2009 and through. The question is how come we, we come from this very devastating perspective when the two worlds collided already into a world of many worlds. And what I formulate in the article and what I want to stress here again is that we need to recognize the ontological fire to so the plurality of worlds and plurality of ontology. And this is an opening but also a pluralization of what everything that comes after. So it's not a new binary again, again, uh, between indigenous and non-indigenous views. Ontologies or words are always produced by mundane practices from non-indigenous, indigenous, non-human beings. And it's deeply connected to what has been called relational ontologies. You remember the graphic from before and place-based thinking. I want to run you through the approach I have <coughs> for my project and then come to an outlook. <coughs> so under the premise that we see rights of nature to bring these insights from onto epistemological dimensions of conflict and violence, into rights of nature. Then I want to speak with my Lila Cardenas words that rights of nature are a chance for ontological opening. They can maybe facilitate <coughs> a platform for encounters between you. They can maybe facilitate encounters between different indigenous and wisdom epistemologies and ontologies. 
and they have the potential for what very called postcolonial moment. <coughs> and she speaks about the postcolonial moment that it involves. <coughs> 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 that it involves a post-colonial moment that involves those making separation. So not everything is the same, but also by connecting and identifying samenesses. So sameness means you're not a dominating new universal. On the contrary, sameness in a post-colonial moment enables difference to be collectively enacted. So we find points of connection. However, when we use different knowledges, this is a form of recognition and perhaps the most pertinent because it implies circulation and transaction according to Legion Davis. Things gather or shed value, gather or shed meaning and effect in their transmission and circulation. But they also alert, alert us, sometimes this is a matter of inflation sometimes a matter of abstraction, and sometimes a matter of misrecognition. And when we look, and this is about forest rights now, so the topic closest to my heart, when we look from this perspective at forest rights, we see, for example, the 2018 Colombian ruling about recognizing the Amazon as a subject of rights. And this ruling started as a claim of young people to stop the destruction of the Amazon because it's contrib contributing to climate change and violate their rights and the rights of future human generation. So this was a case very clear of classical climate litigation. However, in the court reasoning, environmental degradation, not only in the Amazon, but globally threatens human existence. So in line with climate litigation and the protection of human. But then the judge turned this around and said, the Colombian Amazon is a subject of rights that needs to be protected and obliged the government to um, elaborate an action plan for deforestation zero and for restoring the forest. And this is one of the rulings which kind of nicely showed this piggybacking effect. However, it's not about indigenous ontology of the reverse of thinking. Another example, um, Kausak Satya, the living forest, is a proposal of the Sayaku Kichwa communities in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And these are community people I work with. So Patricia Gualingwa, one of the spokespersons, is, um, is the leader I work with since COVID. So I first knew here online. Now I have been there last year for the first time. Um, and we are in constant contact and do several events together. And the Kausak Satcha declaration from Chayaku has kind of been upscaled by themselves. And they say, or they have brought this forward to stop oil extraction, to stop the extraction of balsa wood and of different other extractive activities. You can read the declaration online it's also translated to English and see the documentary on YouTube. And it is not only zoomed up, so it's now the proposal of the Mujeres Amazonicas, the Amazonic women defenders of the rainforest, but it has also traveled to the climate summit. Here's a picture of the women network with great. And while this declaration reads and emphasizes the spiritual connection, sometimes it reads more uh, almost like poetry. How it's brought into practice uses different techniques, also informed or guided by Western ideas of time. So it's connected to the summer house, so the living in harmony with nature, the buen vivir. It's connected with the development plan, the plan de vida. And it's connected, or in, uh, this informs also the development, the, the zoning plans that you can see here and you also find in the um, 
report of the ECA. Um, and it's very clear that there are areas in the community which can be used for hunting, others can be used for um, building houses, others can be used for transit, and some areas are kind of out of touch or are used for recreational purposes for humans and non humans. So, this is uh, one of the flyers from one of our events. And I want to let Patricia speak here for a moment. And she says, um, the slide is in Spanish, I will translate to English. Kausak Sacha, the living forest, is a, is a recognition that the rainforest is a living being, a conscious being, and a subject of rights. This proposal implies a profound change of the concept of nature. This is not something spiritual or something religious. It's life. The consciousness that the rainforest is a being, is a mother, is not in the hands of government, but in the hands of indigenous people. And therefore, this is the only reason why we still have uh, forests at all. Because other initiatives as Yasuni broke down. Yasuni was, or still is, it's alive again um, for those who follow the news or want to follow the news, was an initiative by the, initiative by the Ecuadorian government to not um, get into oil extraction of a part of the rainforest when international communities uh, or states our civil society finance, but especially state government finance them to compensate for what they lose in revenues when they do not um, extract oil there. And it broke down and now it's alive again. The referendum will come, we will see. One point, and this is one of my main focus now, is on the people who do the translation. And what Andrea Schembetti, we um, formulate after years of working with the Amazonian um, Women Network, um, and something I find in my own work too, is that those translations and ontological openings need skilled interlocutors that navigate not only the political discourse, so when we, when, when state governments or politicians talk about viable economic alternatives or national interests, but that they speak of what they want to talk about, about Cossack Satcha and the presence of things that are beyond economy and state imperatives and culture, nature, finally. So the forest as a living entity inhabited by a multiplicity of life forms in an extremely political is a, and this is an extremely political moment in these scenarios because you really have to insist that this is what you want to talk about. And this is more in terms of strategic political framing things, but it also refers to being able to translate the ontology or the ontologies behind it. So one of the central topics for my project is this translation between worlds and ontological brokerage. Just in very brief terms, we, I will wrap this up now. Ontological brokerage draws on different kinds of literatures from social movement studies, what we know about knowledge brokers, the role of academics and activists in chains of activism, and what anthropology has talked about as fixes or indigenous go-betweens. Also, Eduardo Vergara Sucastro is an important reference here, and he say, uh, speaks about ontological negotiators of difference. The limitation, and this is a side uh, a quote from my Sol de la Cadena from, uh, of translation and ontological brokerage is that what is lost in translation is not the meaning or the mode of signification. What is lost is the earth being itself. And her research uh, was situated in the Andes. So she talks about mountains and apples, but the same is for forestry. And the only thing um, 
what ethnographic commentary or academia can do to uh, to acknowledge is to acknowledge the ontological differences. They cannot put these words or these beings together, but they can acknowledge the ontological differences, the ontological fires, and act it in the conver conversation across which communication occurs. So the incapacity to translate can be made. Coming to men. An outlook on the transformative potential of rights of nature. And what I want to stress here that in terms of sustainability, yes, rights of nature have the potential to stop extractivist projects. And one of the most uh, impressive cases was the Los Hedros ruling uh, in 2021, where that stopped a mining project and the very recent intact forest ruling that also stopped the copper mine a major mining project. If you want more information, um, you can look at the Observatory, uh, Observa Observatory of Rights of Nature in Ecuador and the website. You find them easily, openly accessible online. But this happens only when the rights of nature, so the forest, has already been violated. What we also need is these openings and kind of space for proactive agendas for rights of nature. And one of the very optimistic, contemporary optimistic uh, quotes from Mishnah Kanaspu is from the point of view of the rights of nature, I think that these role cases can already be counted as successes. If nothing else, because they reveal possibilities inherent in legal personality that were simply absent in the theory. They also demystify the relationship between rights and indigeneity in ways that are extremely helpful going forward. Finally, they show how ontological hybridization may happen without dictating either why it must happen or its precise content. In other words, Te Urawara and Te Awa Upupwa, so the cases from New Zealand are Te Ora, show how far the law can be pushed and how to bridge the unavoidable generality of Western law with the place-based philosophical traditions that, despite centuries of violent colonialism, still in the US. So the challenges that still persist, apart from this very optimistic or positive potential, that translation has the risk of equivocation in the words of Iveros de Castro, so a yakuruna is not the same thing as a buffeo, as a dolphin, as a delfin, as, a, as it would be in Germany, as a flipper, and Pachamama, for example, is not nature. Then there's a risk of essentialization and romanticization of indigenous peoples that are framed as an ecologically noble, noble savages, or also of nature, kind of in its pristine terms. And not, for example, the Marne nor the very humanized uh, lagoon, a very industrialized area. And then there's a problem of the translatability already mentioned or by, by Marisol de la Cadena of place-based knowledge. So the earth being died, but there's also the problem of the translation between languages and between the embedded and situated meaning of indigenous place thought, but also of communal thought that are non-indigenous and between embodied experiences and linguistic forms. So one of the kind of challenges is the recognition of embedded practices of knowledge. So how do we know about relational ontologies without living them ourselves and responsible translation? So being conscious about the ontological priors and political ontology and the hierarchy between ontology and knowledge. One way I try to put this in practice and discuss um, rights of nature is in House North Knowledge Dialogue. And we had our first event on the 4th of May about water rights, Rios, Lagunas, Gewässer. And we have the second one in June about mountains and montañas, apus, or berge. And this, the third one in July about forest spots with pacha or veda. And I try to bring different disciplines and different types of 
active uh, activist there. And in the water dialogue, we spoke, we spoke with Mani Machado from uh, Colombia, from the Afro-Colombian community and the movement um, about the Rio Atrato case, so the first river which was re recognized as a legal person. We had a geo and environmental scientist who spoke about good ecological status and the one health approach in Germany and Europe. We had Abato Acosta, the father, so to say, of the Ecuadorian constitution, who gives a keynote about rights of nature in general, but also emphasized this need to bring scientific and place-based knowledge together and the effective dimension. So sentiment thinking, feeling would be the important thing to practice here. If you have time, please join us. In, as, uh, these events will be hybrid. We start at six. And then one last also advertisement is that we are finally finishing the German translation of the Pluriverse Across Development Dictionary, German and Lexicon des Lebens with a lot of alternative ideas about development, about rights of nature. And um, this can be ordered online. Um, and the book launch will be on the 20th of October if you are interested uh, to join us, please like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricarda. This was absolutely a wonderfully rich um, sharing of knowledge and an and, 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 and absolute repository of information. Um, thank you so much for these wonderful insights, um, especially how you managed to beautifully also in the end sort of reveal this, the, the, the um, importance and the relevance of rights of nature in mediating this often tenuous relationships between humans and non-humans and how humans see the world. Um, but I don't want to say too much. We have a couple of minutes for a discussion and I warmly invite anyone with any interventions or questions or comments to Ricardo or to anyone else to please share this with us, either by putting up your hand or by typing in the chat box. Door is open. I'm looking forward to questions or comments. Great. Okay. Do we have any specific comments? Any? I'm trying to see any hands. Anything in the chat box? Okay. Perhaps I can get the discussion going. So, one thing that as an environmental lawyer that has sort of always been a complex question to me. And it's something that you sort of address also in your um, presentation, but it is how, um, and how, how does one actually give legal representation to nature? How does one speak for nature? Um, I mean, they are in legal terms and you've also given other examples um, and uh, uh, one can create an ombudsman. You can, you can, you can. There are several legal constructs, but it's often difficult for me to answer this question because I've also get it asked. You know, how does one provide effective representation for nature? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Should I reply directly, or you, um, you are welcome to, and then we can go to yeah. the next question. Um, it's a, it's a. Yeah, as you said, it's a difficult question. Wow. The thunderstorm is just starting here. I don't know if you heard this. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that there's not just one single answer to it. Um, I think it should, but the, the one denominator I have found is that it should be people who are in a relationship with the type of nature that they claim to speak for. And I don't think that has to be just indigenous communities. Also, when we talk about how we put into practice a more ecolog ecologically informed constitution or ecological rules, that this establishment of ombuds person is important. And I think for Western systems or the German system, 
the election of ombudspersons is a good way to go, I would say. Mm. And I think what is important here that you kind of find mechanisms that you include people that are maybe stakeholders, but not rights holders. So companies, for example, that they are not in the same kind of circle. This was one of the main critiques or has always been one of the main critiques of the climate negotiations or everything related to forests that the stakeholder dialogues always include businesses and states and communities as if they were the same, as if they had the same stake. Mm -hmm. And if, if not one party was affected in their fundamental rights. And I think that makes a difference. Yeah, that that makes sense. Thank you. That's very useful. Um, I have got Alexandra. Tost. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Louis. Hi, Ricarda. So nice Louis. that you're here, uh, at least online. And thanks, uh, for, thanks for, your, for your very inspiring and great talk. Um, so I have one, two questions. Um, the first one is that uh, a former colleague mentioned to me that Alberto Acosta sometimes points out, who is one of also an important authors to write on extractivism and rights of nature in Latin America, that it's actually not just an, I don't know if the citation is right, but that it's not just an indigenous concept from Latin America, for example, to speak of rights of nature, but also, for example, in Germany or in Europe, there have been uh, communities or still existing communities that have an like an ecocentric ontology. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there, I wanted to ask you about what, like when I wonder about the transformative potential uh, of rights of nature, I'm also thinking about like, if you think that uh, enriching like our ontological concept of nature in like, for example, in Germany or Europe, um, by uh, getting inspired by by these ontologies, do you think that has the transformative potential, or do you do you think also that like economic structures and systemic capitalistic structures are so much stronger than like that an ontological shift could really provoke uh, uh, changes or transformative potential? Mm -hmm. Great mm -hmm. question, thank you. Um, yeah, I bet you it says that rights of nature has many, have many sources. So um, kind of my students asked him the same thing in the seminar two weeks ago when he came and uh, talked with us. And he said in Ecuador, this was a hybrid movement. So we had environmental activists, we had indigenous organizations, and we brought this together. And we knew about Christopher Stone's writing, which are much more instrumental in terms of rights of nature. So legal personhood without this ontology, intrinsic value thing. Um, but that these intrinsic values can be found all over the world. And this is for communities or also individual people. So one of the or the one leading the Bavarian constitutional referenda for um, the rights of nature or the ecological reform, he's the builder. He's a, was a successful builder, so a company person. And he got so inspired by indigenous ontologies, the rights of nature and the concepts behind it and got in touch with Iberto and this is how it started. So yes, I think it has a transformative potential and I saw it already, like what it can do to the minds of people. Um, but I think it's important or what, what I still um, struggle with is to find how we reach the ones who are in charge and in power. So how do we reach the elite? And there are different ways. So when we have the constitutional or uh, the ecological constitution for Germany. So already leading lawyers are working on that. It's not on not not kind of a niche topic anymore. I think when I talked about this 10 years ago, five years ago, people didn't take it seriously. It was more hippie spiritual talk. And now it has gotten much more serious. So it has become uh to be taken serious alternative, which is great to see. And it feels like taking forever, but I think for a mind change, that's quite quick. 
at least in the minds of some people. Um, and I hope for this inspiring, inspiring moments, but I also hope for education. So my students, uh, when they take my seminar about rights of nature, they usually hear, hear about it for the first time. And the ones most bashed were the US American students. This is funny, but this is because I think it's one of the most capitalist oriented uh, context you can grow up in. Um, and what Michelle Maloney, who is leading the Earth Law Alliance, uh, had, she was here in January with us, like, I you know, got to know her, um, is that she started, if, uh, she started with the Earth Laws Alliance in Australia and then Earth Arts, and now she does new economy and educates business people about rights of nature and relationships to place and relational ontologies. And this, I think it's very important. And these learning experiences between the different networks is also very important. That's actually a fascinating point. I know that Michelle um, is, um, we've worked together at some point and she's now leading a project where they are sort of rereading standard court decisions through a rights of nature or earth jurisprudence lens, which I, which I think is a fascinating yeah. project because it's sort of speaking about transformation and speaking about um, opportunities to um, sort of uh, uh, um, explore different contexts and what is possible quite physically and literally um, is such a rereading of just a normal case that would have been heard in the Bundesverfassungsgericht, but then to read it through the rights of nature or ecofeminism or a, a sort of a radically different sort of lens. And I think that's extremely useful to show us also what could be possible yeah. if we sort of push open these epistemic closures that um, stifles innovative thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Um, so we definitely still have time for some comments and reflections, questions. Um, is there anyone from the audience? I'm looking at the chat box. Any hands? Okay, then I might take, I'm talking way too much, but I found it so super interesting. Well, there is one hand. Jenny, Jenny Bishop, please. Hey, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, please. thank you so much for your um for your presentation. It was super interesting. Um, so for me, there's actually one question rising up in my head right now. It's more about the legal aspect because um for me, like being more in environmental justice based context, mm -hmm. it's also interesting to hear like, about lawsuits from farmers, for example, who are suing big companies um because of their livelihoods and everything. And it would be interesting to know, do you maybe have ideas because there's not such a thing like human international human rights courts, for example, like you can't view as um, in our Western frame nature kind of um, because there's no human body behind it kind of um, way of thinking, you know what I mean? So there's um, it, it would be interesting for me how it could continue in the future. Um, what is actually possible um, also in like legal, legally, um, if you have like, for example, lakes and rivers and everything, is there already like some sort of direction in which also these kind of legal cases could be, could be developed further on without mm -hmm. always having this like anthropocentric um, Western view in mind? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I'm... I'm not sure if I understood you correctly. I will try. But I, um, you said um, that there is no human body behind it. And I think in legal terms, and Louis, you have to correct me because I'm not a lawyer. What most fascinated me that yes, there's uh, no human body that is violated. But this is fantastic because you don't need affected others anymore. So that was one of the legal concepts I understood and it made like, wow, okay, cool. And so this is, uh, this gave, gave this, uh, room for possibilities. On the other hand, who, who then uh, represents this ecosystem or nature 
is a tricky question and it relates to what Louis already uh, raised as an issue. Um, and I think these um, concepts of stewardship or guardianship or legal representative can work, but still the question remains who really can do this and exercise this? And if lawyers do it, what kind of lawyers? Because when I trace the court rulings for Latin America especially, and also here in, in Europe for the Mar Menor, those are people, they have, there are people like hats, actual persons behind it with a mind for rights of nature. And you need these people. Without them, it wouldn't work. So, but there could be other judges. So when we uh, had um, Elisa here from the Observatorio Monero in Ecuador, and they were one of the main parties pushing for the Los Hedros ruling, when they went to the for first local court, the judge laughed at them and said, you are talking to apes. And they turned this into their campaign. So we talked to apes was a hashtag. Hablamos con los monos. And they got people together. And I think also this creative aspect and humor aspect is very important to not get all into despair and to get people on board. Um, so from a legal perspective, um, I think it's already it's always a political question too. Who speaks for whom? And we know that from indigenous studies, like this is one of the main issues ever. And for rights of nature, it's kind of the same. It's not never, it's always a legal, it's always a political decision too, a normative decision. Thank you. I hope that was a good reply to your question. Thanks. Thank you very much to both of you. There is another hand. It's from Eric van Doren. Eric? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, yeah, my name is Erik. I'm a, a lawyer working at the Walter Schucking Institute for International Law at Kiel University. Um, and I have not so much of a question, um, maybe more of a comment, which is not my own comment, but it's a repetition of what I've heard so far. And I'm pretty sure other people know more about this than I do, for example, Louis, but it, it, it follows a bit the comment that Louis made um, and that Jenny made as well, which you often hear, right? That, and you gave the example, Ricardo, of the, the apes. Are we talking at apes? And you see this in American national law very often that um, when people have tried to actually um, do legal representation for animals that it didn't really work. What I really liked is what the government official in New Zealand said when they made the river, uh, the Wanganui River, when they made it and uh, uh, gave it legal personality, so to say, he also got these comments and he said, hey, but this works exactly the same under New Zealand law, which I'm not an expert on, um, as a company. Have you ever seen a company? I mean, it's represented by people, right? So, um, and this was his argument that it, therefore, if we have companies under national law, why not have a river? under national law. And you could make this same argument, I think, also at an international level where famous uh, lawyers that have worked on, on the theory of states and so on, like James Crawford, um, has also said, but what is a state? Have you ever seen a state? I mean, you cannot touch it, right? It's not anything. So um, it's made up by humans. It's a human construct, like a company. Um, and I'm not going to claim here that um, nature is a, a just a human construct. Um, on the contrary, but um, it might for legal purposes work that way as well. So we should not limit ourselves to just um, humans in court because we are way beyond that, right? Um, I've heard in French law that even there's criminal law for, for companies, for example, which is an interesting thing if you, um, if you think about it, There's just as a, as a comment on the side. Thanks again for your talk. Thanks, Eric. Thank you very much, Eric, for that comment. I mean, I think you it, it's it's such a valid point um, that we are willing and able to afford companies um, these sort of abstract conceptions of collections of people and things, um, rights that are enforceable, and they can even, I mean, a company can sue as well. 
um, and we are not even prepared to recognize that nature can sue. So that might be a, I've actually never thought about this parallel, but it might be a very useful way sort of, an, of starting to think about represent, legal representation of nature by drawing on the corporation and the rights of, of the corporation. Sorry, just had to jump in there. Yeah, I, I think I will uh, oppose this <laughs> um, because I think that stewardship or guardianship, because usually the, there are, I think, two main comparisons, either the figure of a company representation or the um, legal representation for a child, so guardianship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's much more like it that this is a concept used or stewardship is a concept used because this relational component and the ontological embedding or the normative embedding in a philosophy or a mind change is what makes it transformative. I think it still works when we have only the aim to protect a river, to recognize it as a legal person and then have uh, a legal representation. The, the thing is that it's hard to make the river finance its own legal representative, like company. And I think this effective dimension is just really crucial. Um, what is, for example, tried out with this uh, Terra Null forest, which is run by, um, by uh, um, artificial intelligence and Bitcoin. Um, a blockchain, sorry, blockchain technology is that the forest finances its own forest, uh, forest free people. It sells it would to finance um, people to kind of take care of it. But it's a very mm -hmm. commercialized idea. And it didn't work. So, but the idea still is there, but it doesn't imply a mind change. It's just an expansion of. The economic model of capitalism, basically, like ecosystem services. I think one of the uh, one of the conceptualizations also is that rights of nature can be conceptualized in terms of property. The the river owns itself, and it can sell its water, and then it has to get something back. It's interesting, but it's not the mind change I would be after. Please, Eric, if you want to have a response. Yeah, to that. Ricardo, I, thanks, Louis, for the, giving me the floor and again. Ricardo, I, I agree, actually, on this, right? So it, I think there's a distinction to be made. The, the government official in New Zealand here used it <laughs> to kind of as a defense that in yeah. the legal representation is not limited to natural persons like human beings. Um, if that then is the correct analogy to use to defend rights of nature, that's a whole other question. Um, but he used it, I think, as a, almost like an outreach kind of thing to, to change people's minds. And I agree with you. I mean, this goes all the way 50 years back to Christopher Stone's seminal article, right, where uh, he later on in the 90s and the 2000s also worked on, on guardianship. He called it guardianship for a reason because of that analogy um, with minors um, and, um, and uh, sometimes also people would say mentally incapacitated people. Yeah. So I also don't know, it might also depend on the legal structure that you're in, which suits, what suits best. Right. Um, but um, I agree with you that not necessarily a company would be the best way uh, to represent this. I mean, um, and it also depends on what kind of structure, like I said, the national legal system has um, on the international level. You could speak about trusteeship, for example, um, um, depending on what meaning you give to that uh, to get to. But I'm sorry, we're reaching a time and I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Thank you very much for those very rich interventions and reflections, everyone. And again, Ricardo, thank you for taking the time um, out of your very busy schedule. I know that you are busy and um, also graciously sharing your thoughts and these wonderful insights. It was a lovely learning experience. It was a storytelling experience. And it was also an opportunity to um, get to know you better and your work better and to introduce your work to us and we very much look forward to sharing that and to um, uh, further engage with you in that work. Um, I briefly also want to take this opportunity to let everyone know
that for the June uh, public lecture, um, we will have Jeff Garver from Canada. And Jeff will um, sp speak about um, ecological integrity, um, among many other things. Um, the advertisement is out, so please join us also for that conversation. Um, we wish you a wonderful day, Ricarda. Thanks again. Um, big round of applause. Till next time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the kind words. Have a nice day. Happy to see you. Bye.